Hey everyone, Larissa here from Beekeeping Made Simple, and I'm here to talk to you guys about stuff going on with your bees. I get a lot of questions this time of year from new students, and uh, some questions are just like really common, and those are the ones that I like to talk about on the live videos. Um, okay, so number one for you beginners out there. I wanted to try to just hone in on like your number one goals, especially your first year or two with your bees. So to just maybe take away some of the overwhelm that you might be having, or maybe you're not overwhelmed, but maybe you don't know what your goals should be. So this might seem obvious, but your number one goal should be to keep your bees alive for a full 12 months throughout the spring and summer, which isn't too difficult, into the fall through the winter, and to open up your hive come the spring of next year, and for at least one of your bees to still be alive. The queen to still be laying again, and for your bees to be, you know, still a colony, alive and running and ready to go next spring. But now that might seem obvious, but the thing is, is that how do you do that? Uh, and so that's one thing people get uh, a little crazy with what they think they need to do. But the number one killer for a colony in general in most of the world is varroa mites. So that should be your number one goal is managing the varroa mites. And the reason why I bring this up is because nobody wants to deal with varroa mites, myself included, everyone hates them. But I will talk to beekeepers who will ask about what direction their hives should face and they have like an apame hive and a top bar hive and this hive and that hive and so many inches off the ground and they just get really specific on all of these details but then they actually tried a mite test and it didn't really work um or they treated once and so then they get really really super specific on things that don't really matter that much and then when it comes to like the number one cause of a colony to collapse it's like they just kind of you know don't really want to talk about it so you really need to focus on that number one goal, which is to keep your bees alive. And although people do not like treatments and you don't want to put chemicals in your hive, I'm sure you don't want to expose yourself to chemicals. It'd be better that your bees are exposed to chemicals and they are alive than that they're dead, but not exposed to um, any kind of chemicals, in my opinion. Uh, if you think differently, that's up to you, but make sure that that is your actual decision, uh, that you would rather your hive collapse than expose them to oxalic acid, formic acid, um, and all of those other options that you have. And when I say mite treatments, I mean spring, late summer, like when the honey stops coming in, and then again, before you close your hive up because those two times are very important. You want those winter bees that the queen is laying eggs for in the late summer to be healthy. You're gonna have a ton of robbing and you're gonna to have to treat again. Now, um, real fast, a lot of people have trouble with testing for mites this time of year. They don't know what they need to put a treatment in. They don't know what their mite levels are. They tried a mite test, it didn't go well. They have a low population, all that stuff. You don't have to test for mites your first year. In almost, well, mainland United States, you have varroa mites everywhere. We have them here on this island, but not every island in Hawaii has them. So you have them in your hives. And although you don't want to just put treatments in without knowing your mite levels, your first and second year you know, cut yourself some slack and just do it anyway before the honey comes in and you are potentially harming your honey with treatments. Um, also, your first year, yeah, you have mice in your hive. You bought them from a commercial apiary. So they're treating. I can guarantee you that unless it's from like a very small place that's not um, really, uh, one second, sorry. 
Um, so you're buying your bees from commercial apiaries. They're treating, so you're probably going to have to treat as well. The mite test your first and second year isn't really to tell whether you need to put a treatment in. It's to tell whether your treatment worked. So if you are having difficulty doing a mite test or your hive population is small uh, in the springtime, you don't have to do a mite test, but it is good to get into the habit of it so that you know what your levels are. So you know if you're doing it right, especially when it comes to things like oxalic acid, if you're using the dribble method, the vaporizer, you want to make sure that all of that is going well. If you're putting like, um, you know, uh, apigard in your hive, you open up the tin and you stick it in there. It's it's in there. <laughs> really, the actual the way that you can mess that up is if it's too hot in there, and that would cause your bees to abscond. Um, so you know if you did that wrong because your bees are gone. So um, number one goal is is that, and then number two goal because yeah, you could have your varroa mite plan down pat. You could do everything right when it comes to that, but still you could have just like an awful, awful, awful winter. You could have tons of wasps, like, you know, just a big drought or whatever that caused, not a lot of food for the bees to forage late summer, fall. You could have just wasps come and other honeybees just decimate your hive. You might just have one hive and it didn't work out. That hive could have nosema and you didn't know it. It could have tracheal mites. Um, there are a variety of things. It could have just had a weak queen. And that queen just wasn't able to really get up and running come next winter. Uh, so when it comes to things like that, you know, in nature, roughly one in every three hives uh, survives and two out of every three hives does not survive. So when it comes to that, the only way to really beat that is through numbers. And so that is your number two goal your first couple of years is to not harvest honey, but to split your hives as much as humanly possible. You want to feed them, you want to give them pollen if necessary. And then once you have eight to 10 frames of brood, split them up. So now you have four to five frames of brood um, in each hive and buy a queen. And don't don't start queen breeding just yet because you do not know if this hive has the genetics that you want to breed from. What you want to do is build your apiary up with as much uh, with as diverse genetics as possible. So get a queen from this person, even get a queen from someone that's not even really a queen breeder, but just someone that has a lot of beehives uh, in your area, someone from your bee associations that, that's been doing it a while find as many local places as possible because they should have the genetics to deal with winters much better or your climate much better than um you know buying them from uh what's that olivares you know out in california or whatever so um you just want to build your genetic pool and you want to build your apiary in my opinion if you have less than five hives it's it's hard it's so much harder than going um, into it with five plus hives. You only have one or two. Uh, now it's expensive. So that's why when your hive does well, you split it and then you split it again and you split it again. Um, and you just keep doing that and you do not try to harvest as much honey as possible. And you let go of that idea of having as much honey. Um, you know, having all that honey at the end of the year. One person asked, what is a good source of info for someone who is keeping bees as a hobby and not looking to sell bees or products? Um, I, I mean, everywhere that's teaching people how to keep bees should be teaching you how to keep bees healthy, uh, trying to harvest as much honey as possible or um, trying to build your bee population up as high as possible shouldn't be really what people are teaching you anywhere. <laughs> um, that's really what you learn when you work for a commercial apiary, uh, which I did. So I did learn another end of the spectrum. But as someone who works for a commercial apiary, the way that they do things is very different from what you would learn taking a beekeeping class from like a small apiary down the street or from your uh, beekeeping association um, or what I teach in my online beekeeping class. I do not teach people how to keep bees the way that they did at a commercial apiary. Um, it's, it's way harsher on the bees. The, 
uh, it's uh, if you love bees, you do not work for a commercial apiary. Uh, that that's about maybe the extent I'm going to get into what what they do there. Um, so okay, so for your beginner beekeepers, your first goal is to. Um, and one person said they were planning on starting with two hives and they were told that's optimal. You can start like buy two hives. Two hives should be enough um, to buy two nukes, ideally two packages if necessary, but ideally two nucleus hives. But then to have the plan to split those hives and go into winter with five. Four is the minimum. Five if possible. Um, split them, catch swarms. I wouldn't really recommend doing cutouts your first year, but if you have a bee association or someone you know who's an experienced beekeeper that does that, that can let you tag, tag along once or twice before you do it on your own, that's great. Because um, you really just want to build the genetics of your apiary. Um, now you don't have to have like full hives, you know, like two deeps and two or three honey supers for all five of these hives. Some of these hives will be small, um, but you should be able to go into winter with at least four beehives. Uh, by the time, you know, late fall, your uh, brood population is pretty low. So they're not going to have, you know, deep, two deep brood boxes full of brood. But um, you should have enough equipment for these five hives. And then when you go into winter with five hives, you just have a better chance for getting out the other end with one or two that you can then breed from again and keep splitting. And those are the bees, the ones that survive the winter. Those are the ones that you want to keep with and keep splitting and um, keep working with. Um, if you buy one hive, then you never know what you're going to get. If you buy two hives, most likely one is going to be kind of a dud and one is going to be okay. Like that's just, you know, the way it usually works. There's a lot of dud hives out there. I don't know how else to describe them, but hives that just do not have, um, the genetics to really keep going and to to gather as much honey that they need to, to get through the winter and all that stuff. Yeah. I want another short one. Okay, I want to <laughs> It's my son. Um, I'll be there in five minutes, okay. So um, two other things I wanted to, uh, the two other things I wanted to talk about were small hive beetles and queen excluders, small hive beetles, and ants are, you know, those things you're going to start seeing crawling around the hive. And sometimes uh, people get really, uh, they, they think it's bad and they think that there's something they need to do about it. So I wanted to talk about that real fast. But first, since someone's asking about queen excluders. Um, so queen excluders, I don't personally use queen excluders, <laughs> um, but yes. some people do. <laughs> Um, okay, so one person saying, why don't my bees want to go through the queen excluder? They have two large hives that are full of bees. Yeah, some people call them honey excluders. So um, usually they will go through the queen excluder when they want to. It helps to put some frames of honey in the boxes up above that excluder or at the very least drawn out combs so that there's something to encourage them to move up there. Uh, but if you don't have frames of honey to fit those boxes that you can move up there, then um, I would just take the queen excluder off. I use a queen excluder if I have a hive where they're just always just bursting with bees. Every once in a while, you have a queen that really just lays a ton of eggs. And no matter how many times I'm just taking frames of brood out to clear out space to prevent them from swarming, they just build more comb and she fills it up really fast and she just starts moving her way up. And so then I'll put a queen excluder on. But to start, when you have empty boxes that the bees haven't even gone up inside, uh, they still have to 
you know, build the comb and stuff. There's no reason why you need a queen excluder on there. The queen isn't even going to go up anyway because there's nowhere for her to lay. Um, why they don't want to go up there, eh, I don't know. <laughs> And they might be deterred by it for one reason or another. You know, it, it can take bees a while to just move on up into the upper boxes if they're totally empty. Um, it's a problem that a lot of students that have the flow hive have. And then I tell them to just keep the queen excluder off for a little bit until they start to build the comb and then put the queen excluder on. Um, so what? why I don't use a queen excluder, not only because it doesn't it encourage the bees to go up and it, it might deter them a little bit before moving up, is because sometimes there's just reasons why bees uh, abandon the brood boxes, especially the first brood box. Now, we have a lot of small hive beetles here since we don't have a frost. And so I have oil pans below a screen bottom with an oil pan below that to catch small hive beetles. It works really well, but if you don't keep on top of emptying, emptying out the oil pan oh, and, stuff, and <laughs> refilling it, it will start to smell. You're going to have pollen and stuff that's going to start to get gross and the bees will abandon that. Or you might have a mouse that died in there or was killed in there. Um, or you might have um, water pooling up on the bottom. And for whatever reason, sometimes the bees just abandon oh, that what? very lower box. And so when that happens, the bees will start to move up. And if you have a queen excluder on it, it's going to keep them from moving up. Um, and so then they might just abscond, which means that the whole hive takes off. The other time that um, it's bad to have a queen excluder on is, you know, Often if the queen is moving up, it's because the bees are filling up the brood section. The bees fill up the brood section when they want the queen to stop laying so much. She stops laying so much, then she slims down and they start making new queens and they're going to swarm soon. So when you start to see a whole lot of pollen in your brood frames, that is a sign they're getting ready to swarm. Um, and so now sometimes the queen will move upwards instead of laying fewer eggs and that is an opportunity for the beekeeper to spot this and to prevent swarming before it happens so hey bruce's bees so when you have a queen excluder on a hive it can sometimes your bees are just going to be swarming when you don't want them to so if i find a queen on the rare occasion it happens up in the honey super i pick her up by the wings i throw her back down into the first brood box and close it up if it happens again, I'll put a queen excluder on it. But other than that, I, I do tell students to not use queen excluders, especially beginners, because you make a lot of mistakes. You don't really maybe know how to keep bees from swarming. And there's just a lot of things that can happen. And having a queen excluder on there really just kind of limits the amount of wiggle room the bees have and the amount of space the queen has to lay. Um, now, yeah, sometimes your queen might go up into that super and lay eggs, and that's not ideal. But as one person just asked in their comments, they're looking for a source of information about beekeeping that's for hobbyists, not for people that are looking to maximize their honey production. And so if you're a hobby beekeeper, then your goal is for happy bees, healthy bees, not for the maximum honey production. And if that is the case, then it should not be a big deal if the queen lays some eggs on a couple frames in a super. It just happens and you put her down below, the eggs hatch and the bees can fill up those frames with honey once the cells are empty. And it's not the end of the world and it's really not a big deal. Um, so also you have plastic queen excluders, you have metal ones, metal ones obviously last longer than the plastic ones. They're a lot easier to clean. And also they do not flop around. What did I do with my queen excluder? Ah, uh, yes, here it is. So, you know, the plastic flop around so if you're putting a box on top that is empty then you see how this is 
starting to bow a little bit and that's what's going to happen you're going to peel it off the hive because it's going to be covered in propolis and sticky and when you do that then your queen excluder isn't perfectly Ooh. flat anymore um so if you put a queen excluder on your hive and then you put a super on top that's empty your queen excluder might not be have enough weight on top of it to keep it really flush with the boxes and so it might not actually exclude the queen uh she might get through and actually even with the queen excluder on perfectly sometimes they are just kind of narrow and can get through so just because you have a queen excluder on doesn't necessarily mean it's a foolproof way i um do use queen excluders when i am selling these i will um give people the option to bring their own equipment with them instead of me putting the bees in a nuke box. Uh, for $10 less, they can bring their deep box with them and frames. And I just set up the hive I am going to take the bees from for this nuke uh, so that everything is down in that first brood box with the queen and everything and put a queen excluder on and then the brood and the rest of everything is up above and um that works most of the time but of course one person came and it was like this raining raining windy day and the queen went up above and we were looking and looking and looking for her and then i finally found her um up above the queen excluder so it does happen but for the most part if you are looking to say split your hive and you're concerned that you're kind of slow at things um you see your queen uh and when you're inspecting it then you can put a queen excluder like say on that brood box and or if it's the second brood box a queen excluder above and below it and then you know where she is so say the next day when you want to do your split and you have everything ready you know that your queen is in that box and you can go down below and pull your brood and you still want to double check and make sure she's in that box but it can help um save some time for you and you know exactly where your queen is um i've i don't use foundation in my hives and so the drone comb, when you don't use foundation, you'll see that the cells of your comb vary quite a bit. And so I have also seen lots of dead drones and queen excluders on my hives. And that's because the drones vary in size. And some of them just, I guess, are so large that I've just, they just get stuck <laughs> and they starve to death with poor things. Um... So, uh, of course, now, if you have a flow hive, they encourage you to use queen excluders because the frames for the flow supers are harder to clean and a lot more expensive um, because, like, the flow frames the it's not foundation that the build, bees build comb off of the frame has the foundation and the cells built into the frame and so you really don't want the queen laying in those cells because it can be harder to clean i mean it, it can be done and the bees can clean that stuff out the same way they clean out other frames but for flow hives it's uh better to use uh the queen excluder and to make sure that the queen stays out of that flow box um but again if you're having trouble with the bees moving past your excluder take it off let them move up let them start building in there walking around let it smell like bees and then put the excluder back on once you know that she's you know down below uh one person asked about wire frames i don't the wire frames they just seem like so much work and i just have no need for them i don't have trouble with cross comb um i just make sure my hives are perfectly level and i have 10 frames in my 10 frame box also at this point my frames i'm rarely putting in a box of 10 totally brand new frames so my frames already do have a little bit of like a very thin you know maybe 16th of an inch um wax build up on the underside of the top of the bar on my frames and um 
when I put frames into a super, if I'm putting a new super on a hive, I'll usually throw in a couple frames of drawn out comb, pull some frames of honey from down below or from my chest freezer from another hive. And just having two frames in an empty super that has drawn out comb on it or comb full of honey is enough to let the bees know what direction everything needs to go in. And um, I, I just don't really bother with it and I haven't found the need for it. Um, okay, so that's, that's my take on queen excluders. If you're a beginner, I would not use them because I think it, mm -hmm. it um, doesn't allow for as many mistakes. Um, and your bees might be more likely to swarm with them on. And then finally, small hive beetle. <laughs> uh, I love talking about small hive beetles because it's, when I came to Hawaii, they were just uh, through the middle of maybe their small hive beetle craziness where the hive beetle and the varroa mite came within like a couple of years of each other and it just wiped out the majority of the population. So when I was interviewing for the job, I was in Pennsylvania and it was just an, an internship. So I was doing like a Zoom thing and they're like, we are losing a lot of hives to the hive beetles. So we don't have like a hundred and something. We have 30. And I was like, okay. And then, and then they emailed me a couple days later and they're like, we actually now have 12 hives. And when I got there, they had like three, everything was just all slimy and gross. And then I went to work for an apiary that had gone from 4,000 hives to 800 because of hive beetles and rural mite like combination. And so in comparison to that, like nothing seems all that bad. Um, and, and so for us to bounce back from that, really, you just need to have low varroa mite levels because hives with a lot of varroa mites have a lot of viruses and are weak. And so then the second stress that comes along, like for us, it would be the hive beetle. But for many of you, it's wintertime. Um, the hive collapses. So you blame the hive beetle for the collapse, but it's actually not the hive beetle's fault. They're just an opportunistic pest. It's the varroa mite's fault. Um, and so we really have to make sure that your hive um, mite levels are low. But, you know, also the second part is, is if a hive is small, then they're kind of weak. And that can be a hive that is taken over by hive beetles. Um, how do you process your slimed out hives? It's been a while since I've had a slimed out hive, but I will just, um, since I don't use foundation, the frames are pretty easy. Just cut out all of that comb. And um, I have tried to melt down that wax to salvage it, but I don't bother with that anymore. I put it in a trash can and take it to the dump so that it doesn't, so that they're, they're killed as soon as possible. Because... Hive beetles will survive for a long time in Hawaii with all of the rotting fruit and everything. Um, but uh, the woodenware and the frames and the boxes, they all just get washed down. The slime gets washed off and dried out in the sun. Um, and, and that's about it. Uh, it's fairly easy to deal with hive slime. Um, but I do want to warn you guys. I don't feed my bees because I worked for a uh, organic apiary and that was very much something that you're not allowed to do. But a lot of you I know will not only give your bees syrup, but pollen patties. And that is a place that I have found a lot of high beetles um, larva will be squirming around. And you might not notice them at first, but they'll be underneath. And sometimes I'll see them even in those towels. You might use the Swiffer towels or the Brawny Dynamax towels, and sometimes I'll see the worms squirming around in there too. Things that don't work for hive beetles are like laying diatomaceous earth down on the ground. We put hives in the lava fields and on the roof of a barn that was metal, a metal roof on the barn. Um, none of these things prevent hive beetles in your hive because I mean for one yeah they need to go down into the ground to pupate but the adult is like you know laying the egg and then that larva is squirming around and there's this slime that it leaves so 
Um, the fact that it then has to leave the ground to pupate isn't preventing the slime from occurring in the hive. That already occurred. And hive beetles can fly. So even if that beetle in your hive that laid that egg and now that larva tries to go in the ground to pupate, even if that larva can't pupate, you still are going to have a whole bunch more adults coming. Um, and then, of course, it rains. And so there's only really so much diatomaceous earth you're going to be laying on the ground. Um, so for one, it's okay to see hive beetles in the hive. It's I see them all over the place. You take off the lid, the bees will chase them into crevices. I have lots of videos of bees chasing hive beetles. Um, they chase them into the crevices. So when you take the lid off, they're all, they all run out. And so, um, that's fine. You want to see bees chasing the hive beetles around. It's fine if you see them on the underside of the lid and stuff. You don't want to see them just moseying around your honeycomb. That's bad. So for one, prevention is the biggest thing. Have low varroa mite levels. And also, you do not want to have an excess of food in your hive. So if you have a small hive, you just bought one or just split it. If you want like one frame of honey for every three to four frames of brood, you don't need more honey than that. You can maybe have another frame that's pollen, but that's about it. You don't want to have an excess of honey or drawn out comb from last year that is just there because you want your frames to be covered in bees. If they're not covered in bees, then that's an opportunity for the hive beetle to start laying their eggs and um, that's areas that the larva will be squirming around on. And what happens is that once there's that uh, slime on the comb, the bees avoid it. So you might even think, uh, I've made the mistake of thinking that a hive was heavily populated. Uh, I saw lots of bees on the outside. And then when I actually opened it up beyond like, you know, a super or two and went through to the very bottom brood box, then I found that the hive actually had beetle slime all over the place and the bees had abandoned it and were moving on upwards. And here I th I'm thinking that this hive is, you know, this like super awesome hive when actually they only had like three frames of brood <laughs> because it's just like a mostly hive beetles so um you really just want to not give the bees too much space especially when they are very small if they're heavily populated they should be able to handle hive beetles just fine especially in areas where you have a decent winter um the hive beetle population should be pretty small it is through the roof here, they, I find them in the trash, you know, um, they're all over the place. I could take a piece of comb from a hive, bring it to my house where I do not have any bees. And I have put it in a plastic bag that was opened and just left it. And it'll have beetles, um, larvae squirming around in it within a week. Um, and I've done that actually for photos and for demonstration oh. purposes for classes. Mm -hmm. It works every single time. Unfortunately, uh, they find it very quickly. Um, someone asked, can I explain what a slimed out hive is? So, so when the the beetle lays eggs, that egg hatches into a larva, and that larva, I believe the slime is its feces, um, and it, that's a sign that you have an infestation. The adult beetles are okay to see crawling around the hive, but when you have small hive beetle larva, uh, or when you're seeing slimy areas, that is a what you really do not want to see. Anywhere you see the sliminess, um, you want to get rid of it. I do have a video on my channel. There's, when you go to my channel's um, page, there's different, you know, levels for the different playlists. And one is pests. Oh, and within the pest section, you'll see the small high beetle one. And I have lots of videos um, and stuff mm -hmm. of what small high beetle slime looks like. But once you see it, you're just like, oh, yeah, that's that's slime. <laughs> um, it's pretty awful. Uh, uh, and hopefully you'll never see it. It's really once you have a high population in the hive. Um, 
And one person says, going into winter, how many frames of honey do you typically aim to leave your colonies? Is there a rule of thumb, so to speak? Well, you want to leave, how much honey you want to leave in your hive depends on your winter, uh, how long it is. And it's not only just how long their winter is, but how much food the bees are going to be eat going to be eating. So like in Pennsylvania, the winter is in crazy cold. We don't get a lot of snow, but what happens is it'll go really cold and then it'll warm up and you'll have like these 50 degree days when you think that, um, uh, you know, everyone's outside in a t-shirt and the bees then leave the hive, they leave their cluster, they go out flying and the more energy they use, the more they fly, the more food that they eat. And so then they're actually going through a whole lot more food than if it just stayed cold for a really long period of time. So it really varies on average for a good portion of the United States, 50 pounds of honey is sufficient. Uh, and then also, you know, you're going to have your backup, which is a super or an eek or something full of your candy or your dry white sugar. Um, but it really varies where you live, how much honey you're going to leave on your hive. I always tell beginners to not take any honey, not to harvest it, to weigh how much honey you have from your frame so that you know how much honey you're leaving in your hive and to not harvest your honey. And that way you can see how much honey is left come the springtime. And that will be um, a good way to start figuring out how much honey to leave your bees. One person asked, how long does it typically take for a new box to get covered with bees? So that really depends on where you live. Uh, and not only like, you know, your climate zone, but I'm talking about your neighborhood, like how much food is there. Uh, it can, if a beehive just swarmed, when they are just swarming, they will fill a box up within, you know, a couple of weeks. It, they move really fast. Uh, now, if you have, if you're in an area where there's not as much food for them to forage, if it's earlier in the spring and it's really rainy, it's going to take, it could take months. Um, the faster they're building, the better the environment is for the bees. If they're slow to move, then there's a good chance that there's not enough food for them. Uh, there might be a lot of competition from other bees or just not an, enough food. Um, I do another reason why you want to get at least two hives to start when you are beekeeping is because um, sometimes bees take a while to fill up that first box because they're weak. They might have a lot of mites and viruses. The queen might not be so strong or it could be the environment. So when you have two hives, if one is doing well and one is not doing well, then you know the one that's not doing well is weak because of the colony. If they're both doing poorly, then most likely it's an environmental issue. And so it really helps to have more than one hive so that you can use them to, to um, gauge what's going on. <laughs> Versus B says that high beetle slime is the nastiest thing in beekeeping. Absolutely disgusting. Uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I'm currently, I still have a baby in the house that has some pretty gross diapers and <laughs> they're way worse than the high beetle slime. So maybe I'm just too used to um mommy life with little ones right now <laughs> the, the high beetle slime does not phase me as much i've also gone to yards where it was just pulled up in a truck and the boss went out turned back around went right back in the truck and said they're all gone and um it's you know just a hundred hives just completely slimed out that um you have to clear out so maybe um it's uh, I've, I've seen a lot of hive slime. <laughs> it also depends on how long you've left it there, um, how, how bad it gets. Uh, it's unfortunate when your hive absconds and you have, you don't get there in time and then you lose all of that honey in there because the bees left and the hive beetles started sliming it out, you know, very quickly. Um, so if you are seeing beetles and you're concerned about it or you just don't like them and you want to get rid of them, you can put the Swiffer sheets or the Brawny Dynamax towels under the lid. Um, but really, 
uh, there's these little oil things you can put between your frames. Those work pretty well. Um, the Swiffer sheets, it just takes the bees a while to chew it up. So if you have a small hive, like a nuke, it could be a while before they chew it up to the extent that the bees are getting stuck in it. I really like the oil pans um, that you put under a hive it, for established hives. They work really well and you don't have to take it off. Bees aren't getting stuck inside it. All of those other little traps there's a, a, an extra step added to it, a little bit of an annoyance. The Swiffer sheets, the bees will get stuck in them. You will sometimes see larvae crawling under them. The oil things, sometimes the beetles don't go inside them. The bees chase them under it. So then when you pull it out, you have to make sure you scrape it so that when you pull it out, tons of beetles aren't scurrying around. Um, but for the most part, these hive traps that I've tried, the small hive beetle traps that I've tried, they all work. But the thing is, is that they're not going to prevent an infestation if your hive is weak or if you have an excess of food and a very low population. The hive beetle slime will not ruin, well, oh, okay, sorry. It will ruin the honey. Um, since I don't use foundation, Another benefit to that is if you have a little bit of slime on a part of the frame, I will just cut that out and use the rest, put the frame back into the hive. And I will maybe, if necessary, um, put it into the freezer. I have a chest freezer and those are really, that's like the only beekeeping gadget that I highly recommend is a chest freezer. If you call it a gadget, it's not really a gadget, but um, I will throw it in the chest freezer uh, and give it back to the bees. And I will cut out that little piece of slimy part. Um, and I will not consume that honey. I won't sell it. I won't spin it because I just, I'm not okay with that. I don't know what the rules are for doing it, but I like to just think about if I wouldn't want to eat it, then I don't want to share it with anybody. Um, uh, and then the frames that are in there uh, full of honey that the hive beetles didn't touch, you just really want to be careful because I have been told that if you spin honey that has hive beetle slime on it, it can contaminate the honey and cause the honey to go bad. So you really don't want to ruin all oh, and stuff. <laughs> You don't want to ruin an entire 60 pound bucket of honey because you didn't want to. Want, you wanted to just save I this one little bit. I'm so sorry. Later. Um, one person asked, why do some hives want to swarm when they have room to expand? Well, it depends on where the room to expand is. If you have room to expand, like say an empty super up top, but the brood section is full, then they're going to swarm because the brood is full and you need room in the brood section. Sentence. Now, whether that's because the bees need somewhere to build calm or the queen just thinks that there's nowhere to lay. I, I mean, I don't really know the specifics on why bees do what they do. It was a long time ago that I read that book, Honey Bee Democracy by Tom Seeley, which I highly recommend about how hives make decisions. But either way, I do know that you want room in your brood box. I will take two to three frames of brood out of each box during the season when there is tons of bees and the hives are really full to keep um, them from swarming for a good couple months. Um, you can't just have room at the top of a hive. Um, now, whether why bees will swarm even if they have room in their brood, it could be, be if they're absconding, it could be because there's a problem within the hive. If they're just swarming and sometimes bees just get into a swarming mode, I have actually never experienced that, but I have heard that some hives are just can be swarmy and can just keep swarming over and over and over again. One person asked, they're having a hard time coming to, with terms with the crushing of bees when you're closing up a hive or putting supers on. Do you have any suggestions? Um, 
So first, are you sure you are crushing bees? Because I was always afraid I was crushing bees, but then I would pick the lid back up immediately and see that there were actually no squished bees under the lid. And if you do some research into how bees see, um, there's a lot of interesting things about um, how they they see in motion and things of that sort that are really interesting and, and their vision's a little bit different. So actually like when you're swatting at bees and stuff, uh, they see it happening slower. And so you really just like no match for them. Also, when you put like a lid down or when you're putting a super down, I do like to wiggle it a little bit once it's like, say, a quarter or half an inch up above the hive when I am then lowering it down. So I move it slowly and I just kind of move it just a little bit from side to side. And that just gives the bees, you know, a couple seconds to let them know that something's going to be moving down. Um, and they almost always get out of the way. You can also use smoke. But I'm not really big on using smoke. And I found that with smoke, they do also still get go back to where they were a couple seconds later. Um, some people slide the super across on from onto one box. They slide it instead of just placing it down. They just like slide it across. Um, I, I prefer to just wiggle it a little bit and before I just place it completely down. I very rarely see the little bee pancakes that I used to see. It was a much bigger problem I had with top bar hives because the frames were all flush against each other. Um, and then also don't use gloves. That is a really great way to minimize the amount of bees you squish. But that's not from putting boxes down and lids down. That's from just picking up frames and stuff. And when you don't wear gloves, you're way more aware of your hands and what you're doing. And actually, even when it comes to when you squishing bees, I feel like there's a scent that that is released. I don't know, maybe from the bee's body being squished. But sometimes I do smell like the scent when a bee is squished and it does seem to agitate the hive. So when I'm in a t-shirt and shorts and no gloves, um, I'm just very cautious and I just move slowly and I haven't found that the bees just get out of the way and I don't squish very many bees, if any at all. And um, they're a lot nicer to me. One person said, when using a top feeder for liquid food, uh, an odor similar to vinegar, I'm guessing this is the sugar fermenting. Is this harmful to the bees? Um, I've never smelled a vinegar. If the sugar is fermenting, I would definitely take it out of the hive. Um, your sugar should not be fermenting. I mean, there shouldn't be anything in there to cause that fermentation, unless you're making your syrup with honey instead of sugar. But when you make your syrup, if you're making syrup with water, you should make it with white sugar. Um, no other kind of sugar or honey. Um, if you use dry white sugar uh, and water, and then you want to add in some kind of like honey be healthy that has the essential oils to help the bees digest it. But you do not want to feed the bees um, anything that is fermenting. I don't I don't believe that that's good for them. In theory, they should not eat it because they're they wouldn't like the scent of it. But um, if they're starving, then they might eat it anyway. Um, so I don't I'm not positive about whether it's harmful to the bees, but I would take the fermenting stuff out and make sure you're using some plain dry white sugar for your syrup. Um. Okay, well, that's my two cents on beginner beekeeping, queen excluders, and small hive beetles. Um, you can watch the video from the start if you just go to my channel and go to live. Then you'll see all of the live videos I've done. And um, I have a video that goes very much 
very detailed into the small hive beetle traps I use that I like and that I don't like and how to use them on the hive. Um, so that's right in the pest section, pest playlist. <gasps> my YouTube channel. My son is very annoyed with me because his TV <gasps> show stopped running <gasps> five minutes into this video. Um, so happy beekeeping and talk to you next month.